There are strange things done in the midnight sun by the men who moil for gold. The Arctic trails have secret tales that would make your blood run cold. Those are the opening lines for The Cremation of Sam McGee, a poem written by Robert Service. The poem was published in 1907. Service was born in England, but became famous as a northern poet. Like so many people before him, he fell in love with the North. I am Danielle Parody, and this is The Place That Thaws. That love of the Arctic is a part of our episode today. One thing I've noticed is that many people I've talked to who weren't from the North are still very much in love with the North. Unlike our Southern perception of rural living, the Arctic is truly rural. In the middle of a blizzard or hunting season, people in the North are forced to respond to their surroundings in a way that many in the South do not. Northern communities hold a close relationship with the land. The seasons and country foods that come from the land and the rivers, the lakes and the seas, are still central to the northern way of life, cultural traditions, and even health. In my conversation with Devin Manick, the 22-year-old dog sledder, I asked him if he was happy with his life in Resolute. We were in his truck driving around and talking. I asked something that was on my mind. What is it like to live somewhere that has no light for months? Do you feel like it's easy to get depressed with no light, or do you feel like you're used to it? Uh, uh, if you're in the wrong place, then yeah, you can get depressed really easily. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I grew up with it, so it's just another day. Yeah. Are you happy living in Resolute? Yeah, I like living here. You seem happy. Well, it's a good place to make money, <laughs> if you know how to make money here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, 2021, mm -hmm. or even before that, I had nothing, like, basically nothing of my own. Yeah. Wow. Um, in two, three years, I've turned, like, completely around, like, like I got a truck now. Yeah, you got a truck, yeah. Uh, 14 dogs and five puppies. Five puppies, two boats, 12 sleds, like, comatique. Uh, I just bought nine snowmobiles from the military. I heard this from other people in town as well. There's a high employment rate in Resolute Bay, and there's also flexibility with schedules. There may not be light for several months, but there's a decent work-life balance. While I was up in Resolute and Grease Fjord, I took a lot of pictures of the communities. There are so many details about the place that I loved especially the bones. There's so much hunting that goes on that there are piles of bones along the shore, and some people throw them up on top of their sheds to prevent the polar bears from scavenging. There's also these little signifiers of northern life. Kids' bikes sitting on the ice in the Bay of the Arctic Ocean, oil drums being used as weights to hold things down or to prop things up. Snowmobiles lined up outside people's houses. Opportunities and risks are not seen the same way between different parts of that community. So that's an interesting one. Also. That is the voice of one of the scientists we are speaking with today. We talk about the Arctic and adaptation. Can you introduce yourself and describe the work that you do? Yeah, sure. So my name is Martin Sommerkorn. I'm German, but I these days live in Oslo. I'm currently the head of conservation for WWF's Global Arctic Program, which is a very small office, um, but we coordinate the Arctic activities of our national organizations in the Arctic countries, mostly on issues like ecosystem-based approaches to conservation, to management, ocean governance, sustainable development, and also species conservation. So 
So that's me. I'm therefore looking very much into the issue of climate change in the Arctic, because as probably most people have heard of, the, the, the Arctic is the kind of ground zero for climate change. We have the Arctic warming at about four times the rate as the average of the globe over the recent decades. And that not being enough, I should also say that the main reason why that is so significant in the Arctic is that this warming actually affects uh, the time that we have ice versus water, snow versus rain. And that emphasizes the effect of these temperature changes uh, and makes the Arctic a very, very different place in just the next couple of decades. I am talking to Martin virtually. He lives in Norway. He is one of the lead authors for the Polar Chapter on the report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPPC. He also works with the World Wildlife Fund, or WWF, on conservation in the Arctic. Like those Arctic explorers that came before him, Martin is also captivated by the Arctic. He told me more about what he found interesting about the Arctic and why it was important to study from a climate change perspective. Uh, we have a couple of flagship species that we, that we keep an eye on. Um, these are mostly species that are dependent on ice or snow on land. And yeah, that's, uh, that's basically what we are doing as the program. But I'm an ecosystem ecologist by training from a research career. And I am looking very much into uh, ecosystem approaches to conservation, linking the governance of how we relate to the natural world to approaches that are conducive to conservation, preservation, also protection. And I'm very much convinced that we need to basically change our attitude to nature, and especially in the Western world, not necessarily in the indigenous world, to see how we actually rely on it and therefore how we want to be stewards for the natural ecosystems, for nature, so that we can thrive on this planet. Farley Mowat once wrote about the love of the North as a sort of Arctic fever, an incurable illness. Here's what he said. The Arctic fever has no effect on the body, but lives only in the mind, filling its victim with a consuming urge to wander again and forever through those mighty spaces where the caribou herds flow like living waters over the roll of the tundra. I've been longing to return ever since I left, and I noticed that most of the people who weren't from the north also seemed enamored of it. Why are you so interested in the North? <laughs> yeah, I think originally it was the place that brought me back to myself and to have me having insight that stem from the awe that I can link to that place. It's the it, it's it's nature, it's people, it's showing the relationships and the dependencies very clearly between humans, nature and the elements. So that, I think that was the fascination at the very start. But then I, I basically just started to love the place and the people and nature there and um, got fascinated first through a, or next, I should say, through a scientific eye and wanting to understand how the ecosystems work across the Arctic, wanting to understand the relationships between organisms, plant, the soil, the atmosphere, the water and the people. And so I had a research career uh, for 15 years where I spent basically every summer, 15 summers in a row, two to three months out in the field doing stuff research basically and um, 2007 I decided that I didn't want to write more papers about the Arctic but actually apply that knowledge in the policy sphere basically doing science to policy work and WWF is just a place that offered me a, a good possibility to do that. I'm now head of conservation for WWF's Global Arctic Program. We coordinate things around our engagements in the Arctic. We try as I said to earlier to connect local issues with international issues and policy making and vice and vice versa and back down. As Martin and I were talking, I had to take the opportunity to ask him, a climate scientist, what is climate change? <laughs> climate change is the forcing of the climate of our planet through our emission of fossil fuels. And that forces the CO2 concentration 
and that of other uh, relevant greenhouse gases in the atmosphere up, which basically means that the atmosphere and then also land and water absorbs more heat from the sun. And that has a huge cascade of repercussions on first physical systems, then biological systems, and then also human systems. And we are struggling to actually meet the adaptation that is required to actually address these issues. We are both on the mitigation side, so how to actually keep um, emissions at bay. And we are also struggling to, especially in the near future, to adapt to these issues because the changes are going to be huge challenges for mankind. Martin said that the changes we are seeing are going to take place in the next couple of decades. That's a pretty quick time frame. So um, within the next couple of decades, what do you anticipate the changes are going to look like? Many people see these changes already. Uh, they have they have started already a couple of decades back. In many places of the Arctic, the Arctic is already transformed from one system that is high north to one that is more boreal looking like. But to bind it to some very concrete changes, we have been seeing already the transgression of a globally unique multi-year sea ice system in the Arctic to one that is majorly and mainly composed of first-year ice with a little bit of multi-year sea ice left. And this kind of young, thin ice dominates now the Arctic sea ice, which makes a huge difference for all the biodiversity that is linked to it, but also to how people can actually operate on it, with it, through the waters. And we expect that actually the first completely summer ice-free Arctic will occur at some time before 2050. And that is what science at the moment agrees on. Uh, at which time, in which year, we don't exactly know, but it will most likely be before 2050. So that is one of the big changes. If you uh, flew across some of the permafrost landscapes of the Arctic, you will see that they look almost like having a disease because we see so-called slope failures in many, many places, which means that there is just erosion happening because there is ice-rich permafrost underneath and the ice melts, thaws, and some of these slopes just collapse. And that is more in places where you have more of this ice, less in places where you have less ice, but the permafrost is thawing, and that is a huge problem in, in many places of the Arctic. The Greenland ice sheet is uh, is prone to disintegrate at global temperatures uh, towards between 1.5 and 2 degrees. Global temperature rise between 1.5 and 2 degrees. And we don't know exactly when and how fast, but it will contribute much to global sea level rise. So there's huge things happening, and that's only touching the physical side of things. We have in the northern Barents Sea, which is north of Norway, we had, because of the good connections to the warming North Atlantic, um, we have basically the ice having retreated very, very far towards the pole. And it has changed completely the fish communities that dominate the whole area on that shallow shelf sea, which is one of the most productive shelf seas in the world and subject to huge fisheries that put uh, millions of fish meals on, on the tables of, of people in the Northern Hemisphere. Martin is not mincing his words here. Diseased landscapes and an ice-free summer are in the Arctic's future. I think we are now at a place where a lot of people are tempted to tune out. But what comes next is important. I think the first thing is to note that we need to basically have an all hands on deck situation here. So we need to ask ourselves, how can everyone, how can every sector contribute to making that transition? How are sectors, how are people affected um, by climate change and what would be actually a good basis for their continuation, both as economical sectors, but also as communities in the North? What is it that we can build livelihoods and economies on in the future? And I think that's probably what, what you mean with frameworks, but we can also, you can also correct me if I misunderstood that. There is, there is a real push to say, okay, what is actually the constant here? It's the nature from which we live and we do have frameworks on which we can build also livelihoods in the future. These livelihoods um, may actually be based on different species 
They may be based on different ways to go after uh, fish stocks. They might mean that we have to transition from hunters of sea mammals to fishermen, but we can still try on this basis to adapt to these changes and to remain resilient communities and cultures. This might sound a little bit too warm because I always, and the chapter makes that very clear, especially when, when we talk about projections, these changes are going to be profound. And we can only hope that nature has the ability still to reorganize itself uh, so that we can actually have new species, uh, fish species coming on the back of the old ones, rather than just a gazillion of jellyfish indicating that the ocean is not working anymore as a, as a system, that the connections between the trophic levels are cut and uh, evolution basically cannot, cannot, cannot keep step. Do you still get invited to dinner parties, Martin, or do you <laughs> do people not want to talk to you anymore because of this? It's a it's a funny question. No, I do, I I I, uh, <laughs> I still get invited, um, but it has been also 2019 that we produced this report. So so it's getting less invitations. But I I can report that there were many people who actually at the time it came out read the polar regions chapter and asked me how I can actually cope with all this knowledge. Um, because it is so in your face what's, what's going to happen and uh, why I wouldn't give up and why I would still be an optimist and motivated to pursue this. So I, I always say that I am, um, despite my quite damning verdict, also including on COP28 um, from an Arctic perspective, I would say that this is our only chance to, to, uh, to work and, and limit uh, the impacts of climate change. Every tenth of a degree counts. Every good deed to be prepared and to, to connect the nature, natural world to the people's world in the Arctic better and more dynamic and adaptive actually counts um, to limit the impacts. While there's dramatic changes ahead, it's important to note that every tenth of a degree makes a difference when we are talking about climate change. <laughs> Hello, I'm Rick Harp, host of APTN News Brief, a daily podcast version of the nightly broadcast of APTN National News. Available on all major podcast platforms, APTN News Brief is your quick way to hear the headlines every weekday morning. Learn more at aptnnews.ca slash podcasts. In our first episode, Peter Amarulik was driving Trevor and I around Resolute Bay. We spent a lot of time looking at the shores and the water, as well as the polar bears. But we never got to see under the water. And as we talked to scientists and locals about what was changing, I wanted to know more about what was in that water. Remember, at Peter and Nancy's house, we saw a poster with some of the sea creatures. Yeah. Wow. In our bay, most of them. Yeah. Oh. Oh, sorry. We're just looking at a picture of all of the uh, the a jellyfish. Friend of, a friend of Peter's, a friend of ours, he's a scientist too, a diver. He goes, see what's in our ocean, in the bottom of our ocean. It's more than you would think. Yeah, a lot. Like a lot of stuff. A lot. Never knew there were so much animals down there. A lot. Yeah. Sea creatures until they showed us. We also talked to Peter about diving. It turns out that in addition to his work with QIA, the Kikatani Inuit Association, he has also been a diver. He's done hundreds of dives. I did about 300 dives up here. I enjoyed it until my health went down. <laughs> uh, then we still be getting water samples for Environment Canada over the over the years, and they gave me the access that polar shelf up there with their help. Peter told me to be a diver, you have to be emotionally prepared. Strong mind, good health, good sinus, willing to dive, not scared going in the water. Uh, that's what I was told. That's what I learned, and 
I want to see CO above me. So I got a chance to see one and see the beluga whale. Uh, got to be really committed to it if you really want to dive. Because uh, I've seen students uh, got everything, uh, all their certificate to go in the water. And once they went in the lake, they just couldn't be in there, you know. <laughs> So join us as we peer beneath the icy waters, guided by the wisdom of locals like Peter and Nancy, and we glimpse a world teeming with life. From the majestic kelp forests to the elusive creatures called butterflies and angels who call these frigid depths home. Every organism plays a vital role in the delicate balance of the Arctic ecosystems. I spoke with a researcher, Amanda Savoy, She is a marine biologist at the Canadian Museum of Nature. We spoke about the way that researchers are relying on locals in the North for a year-round perspective on the weather and climate change. Can you describe for me, and I guess like most people in the world who have not been on an Arctic dive, what that's like? Yeah, so um, I've only been diving in Cambridge Bay, but I think there's similarities and differences between different parts of the Arctic, but... First of all, it's very cold. If, if you've ever kind of put your feet in the water, like say even in Atlantic Canada, you know it's cold, like it's not comfortable for swimming, but the Arctic is even colder. So seawater doesn't freeze at zero degrees, it freezes at minus 1.8. So the water can actually be below zero. Um, it's not usually below zero at the surface, but sometimes when you get down to the bottom, it's, it's below zero. So we have to wear at least big dry suits, which can be really bulky and they're like super thick. And I like layer as many layers as I can under my dry suit. Then I put the dry suit on. So it's a big like prep period to get in the water. But then once you get in, it's so beautiful. The water's really, 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 really clear. At least around Cambridge Bay, it's like crystal clear, like in the tropics, like, and it's this beautiful turquoise color. Like you would think you were somewhere like in the Caribbean if it wasn't so cold. The Canadian Arctic is warming at a rate three times the global average. As the temperatures change, species migrate further north because a new habitat is open to them, or they are fleeing farther into cold waters. Scientists are working to map out this area of the ocean, as well as study the effects of the warming environment. Seaweed is like all marine macroalgae so basically algae that live in the ocean that you can see with your eyes because there's also microalgae like little phytoplankton diatoms Um, and then kelp are kind of the most well known in terms of what you might have seen before or what people see when they're diving because kelp are these large brown algae and they're the ones that kind of make underwater forests so a lot of people talk about kelp forests like in California you know you've heard of like the kelp forests and the sea otters um, but we also have kelp forests in the Arctic and I've been working in Cambridge Bay so I've been working out of the Canada High Arctic Research Station because my work is funded by Polar Knowledge Canada and I've been scuba diving all around Cambridge Bay and it's super beautiful and it's really amazing and we've been yeah we so basically we've been sampling as far as we can get around the area of Cambridge Bay to study basically where are the seaweed what's the biodiversity how many species are there and trying to kind of map out um, different kelp forests and where they can be found Um, and we've been working with a local guide John Lyle Jr. a Inuit guy from Cambridge Bay who's been I mean he's like the most important member of our team because he's the one that drives the boat and tells us where to go and how you know where is safe what days are safe to go out that kind of thing so it's been a really cool experience. Country food changes depending on what area of the Arctic you are in. In both Resolute Bay and Grease Fjord, a lot of people we spoke to said they preferred seal meat. In other areas, a lot of people rely on Arctic char for protein. So here is where the kelp comes in. So if we think of fish as being usually like the species that is most consumed, we know that kelp forests create like these habitats that are really, really useful, just generally speaking, for fish, because they are always hiding in the kelp, right? Like if you think of a barren rock versus like a, a forest, like the all the little fish can hide in amongst the kelp. There's lots of other things that live on the kelp that fish can eat. And then, so not so much in Cambridge Bay where there isn't very big tides. So people can't really collect like harvest from the intertidal because there isn't really an intertidal. 
But my colleagues that are working more in the Eastern Arctic, in Iqaluit and in like Ungava Bay area, there's still a lot of traditional food harvesting from the ocean. And so these are really, really important food sources just in themselves, like even the seaweed are a traditional food source. And then mussels. Below the frozen water, there's so much life in the Arctic Sea. But as Amanda Savoy and Martin Summercorn remind us, this balance is under threat. The warming temperatures and changing landscapes are reshaping the very fabric of the Arctic, challenging both traditional ways of life and scientific understanding. Yet, amidst the uncertainty, there remains a glimmer of hope, a recognition that by working together, we can mitigate the impacts of climate change and safeguard the Arctic for generations to come. In the end, what Farley Mowat wrote about Arctic fever serves as a poignant reminder about the interconnectedness of all life on Earth. Whether through poetry, science, or personal experience, we are united by our shared reverence for the Arctic, a place that both captivates the imagination and demands our collective stewardship. On the next podcast, Trevor and I return to Iqaluit, the big city, and speak with the first premier of Nunavut about a lake that is no longer there. I grew up in a place uh, where it was hard to find any body of water. And we used to go to uh, up the hill and uh, go swimming on a pond, uh, which was deep enough. But today there's no sign of it because the permafrost melted and it's gone. So I, I tried going there with my children to show them that this is where we went, but we can find it. The Place That Thaws was written and recorded by me, Danielle Parody, edited by Jesse Andrushko, produced by Mark Blackburn. You can find this and other APTN podcasts on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or whatever podcast app you currently use. The title music is by Angela Amarillo. Her song is about the springtime. You can find her music on all major streaming platforms. All the sources for this show can be found in our show notes. You can email me, dparody, P-A-R-A-D-I-S, at aptn.ca. If you like this podcast, please consider donating to support Indigenous news. Go to aptnnews.ca slash contribute. This podcast was recorded in the Edmonton Public Library. I'm Kathleen Martins, a reporter with APTN News. Homeless, houseless, shelterless people, they aren't hard to find in Winnipeg. They're on the sidewalks, in bus shelters, and down alleyways. They're living in tents and squatting in empty buildings. They're even sleeping in abandoned cars. But who are they? Hear their stories in my new five-part podcast called Our Relatives. Listen on your favorite player.